Let's take a look at how to create graphical user interfaces in Python. There are several libraries for this, but one of the most popular and perhaps the most convenient for use is tkinner. In Python 3, tkinner is built in, so we don't even need to install it using PIP or anything like that. Let's get started. The first thing we do is import tkinner, which is often imported as tk. Every TK inter program requires a basic widget, which will be displayed on the window itself. To create this basic widget, we use the TK function. At the end of every TK inter program, we need to call the main loop. This keeps the UI system running, making the window responsive and able to interact with the user. We see that when we run the program, the window is indeed created. Although it is empty for now, it's a fully functional user interface window. Let's define the dimensions of our window in pixels, which can be done using the geometry function, passing a string of the pixels in x times the pixels in y. We see that the size of the window is indeed as we defined. We can set the name of the window using the title function. Let's give it a name. When we run it now, we see our window's name in its title. Let's start putting things in our window. The UI elements we add are called widgets, and let's begin by adding a label widget. We create the widget using the label function, and we need to pass the parent widget, which in the case of this label will be root. Besides that, we can pass additional parameters depending on the widget. For a label, it makes sense to pass the text it will display. After creating it, we need to add it to the window itself. For this, we need something called a layout manager. In TK Enter, there are a few such layout managers, and we'll start with the pack layout manager. The idea of pack is that it places the widgets one after the other according to the order they are added. When we run the program now, we can see our label displayed on the window. Now let's add a text box widget, and we do this very similarly. Of course, we also need to add it to the window using pack. Now we have a large text box under the label where we can write. If we want to limit the height of the text box, we can pass it a height parameter, which determines how many lines of text it will display. For instance, if we pass one, we see that it's much narrower now, displaying only a single line of text. Another useful widget is entry. An entry is very similar to a text box, but supports only one line. So it's useful when we want the user to enter, for example, a name or email and we see our entry below the text box. There's also a check button widget, which allows the user to check or uncheck an option. Let's add a button, and of course for a button, we can also set the text. We have a button, but currently clicking on it does nothing. To add functionality to the button, we can connect it to a function. Let's define a function. To link the button to this function, we pass the command parameter. Note that we write the function name without parentheses because we don't want to call the function ourselves. This function is a callback, meaning the UI system will call it when the user presses the button. When we click the button now, we indeed see button clicked, meaning the function ran. Let's remove the widgets we added to make it more organized, and instead, we'll put just a button. And we see our button, very similar to what we had before. We said that the idea of pack is that it arranges the widgets one after the other according to their order of addition, but it doesn't have to be from top to bottom. We can pass a parameter to pack that determines where it will add the widgets. The default is indeed top, so when we pass top, it looks exactly like before. But let's try, for example, left. And we see that it now attaches the button to the left side instead of the top. We can also pass right or bottom. Besides that, we can pass another parameter to pack called fill. Fill has two possible values, x and y. If we pass X, we see that the button now stretches across the width of the entire window. Let's see what it looks like if the button is at the top. 
Now note that if we move the button to the left, the fill no longer works because the value we gave to fill is x, meaning there's only significance to a fill of x if we're adding the widgets from the top or bottom. But if we change the fill to y, we see that the button stretches the entire height. If we now add another button and set its side to left, we see that it's added to the right of the button that was there before. Another type of widget we haven't seen yet is frame. The idea of a frame is that it's a container, meaning its role is to contain other widgets and help us position them. Let's create two such frame widgets. Of course, if we run this now, we don't see anything because a frame by itself is meaningless. Its whole purpose is to contain other widgets. Let's see how we can use these two frames to position six buttons in two rows. First, let's add the buttons. Notice that as the parent of the buttons, we don't pass root, but the frames. The first three buttons will have frame one as their parent, and the last three, frame two. We see the six buttons arranged in two rows. Notice that the side of the buttons is left, so they're positioned next to each other. But for the frames, we didn't define the side value, so they will have the default value, which is top, so the frames are one below the other. Let's say we want the buttons to take up the entire width. Let's try giving the frame a fill of X. We see that the first frame sticks to the left side because it's trying to take up the entire width, but the things it contains are still their original size and therefore don't take up the entire width. What we need to do in addition to that is also give the button itself a fill of X, and we also need to say that its expand is true. Now we see that the first button indeed expanded, and if we do the same for the other two buttons, we see that the width was divided equally, and they indeed take up the entire width. If we want to space out the two rows of buttons a bit, we can use padding. There's padding in X and Y, but note that this padding would also be above and below the frame. Now, generally, in cases like this, where we want to position many widgets in an organized structure, it's sometimes more convenient to use a different layout manager instead of pack, called grid. The idea of grid, as its name suggests, is that it helps us build a grid within which we can position widgets. Instead of the frames we used before, let's define a grid in root itself. First, we need to define the rows and columns. Let's define three columns and two rows. Note that we need to give each of them a weight value. The weight determines the ratio between the columns, so if we give them all one, all the columns will be equal. Now, since we removed the frames, we need to change the parent of the widgets to be root. Now, instead of using pack, we'll use grid. When using grid, we need to define the row and column where the widget will be positioned. Let's arrange the buttons so that three will be in the first row and three in the second. We see all the buttons, each in its position according to its row and column. If we want to enlarge them so that they take up the entire height of the row and the entire width of the column, we can use the sticky parameter, which causes the widget to stick to one of the sides. We pass the value of sticky as a string, where the letters determine where the widget will stick. N represents north, meaning the top part of the row. S is south, the bottom part of the row. E is east, the right side. And W is west, the left side. If we include all of them in the string, then the widget sticks to all the edges, meaning it fills the space of the cell. And then we see that the buttons are large and adjacent to each other. We can also put a grid within a grid. Let's define a frame and put all the buttons in it. Now let's define that root will have two rows and one column. Let's put the first frame in the first row. We see that the entire grid of buttons is indeed only in the top half, meaning only in the first of the two rows. Let's now define another button and put this button in the second row of the root.
we see that it's indeed displayed below the grid of the other buttons. Let's put a text box, below it a label, and then a button. Now let's handle button clicks by adding a function. What we want to do when the button is clicked is to retrieve the text from the text box and display it in the label. So, to retrieve the text from the text box, we use get. And to update the text of the label, we access the label with square brackets with text in them. We see that when clicking on the button, the text in the label updates to what we wrote in the text box. But what if we want the update to be immediate without the user needing to click on the button? We can do that, but for that, we need a special variable that has the ability to keep track of the value appearing in the widget. The type of these special variables is defined in tkinter, and if we want to keep track of the value of a string, we can use stringvar. Now we can use this variable as the text of the text box, and the idea is that when the text in the text box changes, our variable recognizes this change and updates accordingly. So, if we use it also as the text of the label, a change in the text box will trigger an update of the variable, which in turn will trigger an update of the label. And indeed, we see that when changing the text in the box, the text in the label updates immediately. We can do something similar also for radio buttons. Radio buttons are intended to allow a user make a choice out of several options. Let's replace the text box with such a radio button. Again, we want to immediately react to the user's choice, so we still need a TK inter variable that can keep track of the state of a widget. We'll pass this variable in the variable parameter. Note that the radio button has both text, which is just the text displayed next to it, and a value which is the value that the variable will receive when choosing that radio button. Let's define two more such radio buttons with their values. And at the initialization of our variable, we'll give it the same value as the radio button we want to be selected when the program starts. These special variables that can keep track of the state of a widget don't have to be of type string, they can also be a number. So let's replace the string that follows the state of the radio buttons with a numeric variable that will do that. And of course, we'll also update the values of the radio buttons to numbers. And we need to change the type of the variable from string var to int var. One last thing I want to address is capturing the event of closing the window. This can be very useful for various cleanup tasks, maintenance, or saving data to a file. Basically, every task we might want to do when closing the program. To handle the event of closing the window, we use the protocol function. And as a parameter, we need to pass it the string wm delete window. We also need to pass a callback, which is the function that will be called when closing the window. To keep things simple, I'll just print something in the function. Also, in the last line of this function, we must call destroy. That's what actually closes the window. And if we handle the event of closing the window, it's our responsibility to actually close the window. And we see that when closing the window, the message we wrote appears, meaning we indeed handled the event of closing the window.